A backdoor has been found in Cisco's ASAs, or Adaptive Security Appliances. You can think of it kind of like a firewall. In this video, we're gonna break down how the backdoor works. We're gonna go over the report by Talos, and at the end, I'll kind of give my opinion on why I think all of this is happening so close together. Also, if you're new here, hi, my name is Oliver Learning. I make videos about software security and cybersecurity, so if you like those things or just wanna hang out with me, hit that sub button, really appreciate it. Also, go follow me on Twitch, I stream there too. Now, the backdoor we're gonna talk about was caught by Cisco Talos, the threat intelligence organization within Cisco. What they do is they collect telemetry from devices around the world, as well as crash dumps from failed hacking attempts, and use that to put together intelligence about campaigns that are going on around the world. They're calling this campaign Arcane Door, and the backdoor we're gonna talk about is in the Arcane Door campaign, but I think what's happening with Arcane Door is really interesting. A new espionage-focused campaign found targeting perimeter network devices. Arcane Door is a campaign of nation state hackers trying to get in to perimeter devices on very, very important networks, telecommunication providers and energy sector organizations. Now, what's unfortunate is that they don't know the initial access vector of this campaign. What it likely is, is there's a zero day vulnerability in the Cisco ASA software that is being exploited. But the problem is when you're doing the assessment of a security incident and the campaign behind it, it's really hard to determine what the initial access vector was. Because if there's a backdoor in the device, that backdoor will still be there, and typically they're doing a long-term campaign. They have a lot of data that they're sending in and out, and if they make one mistake, you can catch that back door, and you can find the persistence mechanism. But the initial access vector, the exploit they threw to get in there, is much harder to find. It's a one-time event, and it happens so fast that it's pretty common for it to just get missed, right? And if you don't know exactly when it happened, you may never find it. But what is interesting, though, is the back door itself. It's called Line Dancer, an in-memory implant. And here they go into the technical details. I want to highlight a couple of interesting pieces about this. The first one is that it's an in-memory implant. It's much more difficult to audit an in-memory implant, meaning memory that never touches disk, as opposed to a .exe that goes onto the flash, right? So by leaving it in memory, that tells us two things. One, very advanced actor, most likely a nation state, but also two, they're very, very particular about their code not getting caught. This may have taken years to develop and they wanna make sure that no one sees what they're doing. Now the Line Dancer backdoor enables a couple of really, really interesting features features that are kind of scary if you're a security-minded person. First, it disables syslog. Okay, obviously, right? They don't want any logs going out from that device. The next two are the most interesting two, in my opinion. The first is they hook the crash dump process, which forces a device to skip crash dump generation and jump directly to a device reboot. This is crazy. A lot of the bigger firewalls like Palo Alto, Sophos, Cisco, et cetera, have features that when a particular process crashes, they want to know about. It. The manufacturer wants to know about the crash for two reasons. One, they want to provide their customer with a good product and they want to figure out where, where in the process did it crash? Is it a bug that we can fix? But also two, a lot of times when devices are getting exploited, it has to do with memory corruption vulnerabilities, doing a buffer overflow or a heap overflow. And those are very difficult to get right. By hooking the crash dump process, this actor is actually preventing if their exploit or their backdoor were to fail, Instead of sending the crash dump out to Cisco Talos, it says, uh, 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 we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna reboot the device instead. This is designed to evade forensic analysis as the crash dump would contain evidence of compromise and provide additional forensic details. And the last one is actually how they're doing their command and control, their communications between the threat network that they're controlling this from and the target network that got hacked, right? They hook the AAA functions to allow for a magic number authentication capability. When the attacker attempts to connect the device using this magic number, Number, they're able to establish a remote access VPN tunnel by bypassing the configured AAA mechanisms. And they go on later to describe this here. But basically the implant allows a threat actor to put a magical 32 byte token. And if that token is found in any of the packets that cross over this device, instead of doing the normal functionality that would reply to that device, it takes the data inside of that packet with the magic value and runs it instead. I do find that interesting here that Talos didn't give us the 32 byte value. I think that's for two reasons. If you know the 32 byte token, you can then go out and in theory take control of devices that are compromised, which is probably not good. We don't want everyone to have access to this network of, of implants, right? But also two, it may be that the actor has uniquely keyed 
every organization they've hacked with a different token. And if they show us this organization's 32 byte token, it may reveal which organization got hacked and maybe become a bit of a privacy concern. You can look at very basically, this is a decompilation, I think either probably in Ghidra or Ida, depending on which one you use. Um, this is a decompilation of the packet. So it says the payload is equal to the IP packet. So it goes to the IP header plus hex 20. And if within that IP packet, there are hex 20 bytes that match some magical string, we then take that base 64 payload out of there, decode it, and then we run that as shell code. Very simply, if a magic word is said, jump to the code inside of it. This gives the threat network the ability to arbitrarily command and control this device. Now what's even more interesting is the way that this backdoor persists on the device. Basically, they're taking advantage of an old vulnerability in Cisco ASAs. When the Cisco device goes to reboot, what it does is it looks for this bundle called clientbundle.zip. It'll take that client bundle and it'll run the Cisco config.lua script inside of it before it goes and actually reboots. Because the Cisco ASA looks for this file and will always run the Cisco config.lua script, they're able to put their malicious code back onto the system even though it's rebooting. This is a in-memory implant sort of, but the way that it persists does have to go to disk, otherwise there's no way for it to maintain itself. As for right now, there really is nobody who's been directly attributed with this. No one knows who's hacking these devices. Because of the sophistication of the implant. They're pretty confident this is a nation state actor, but no one knows which nation state. So if they have come up with some ways that if you do have a Cisco ASA and you think you may have been hacked by this, you can go run these commands and check for it right now. If you're on show memory region and then include the Lena command, what I'm assuming is that the Lena command is the binary that runs all the major Cisco ASA features and is where the malicious actor is putting their malicious code. What they're saying is that if you look at this memory map and you see multiple pages of memory that are readable and executable, that that is an indicator of compromise. The reason being there should only be one page for this binary that is readable and executable. And by having a second one, it indicates that this is a place where the malicious actor is hiding their shell code to run their implant in memory. Also, interestingly enough, I saw on Twitter somewhere, if you think you're affected by this backdoor, what you can actually do is instead of rebooting or trying to crash dump it, which have all been hooked by the backdoor, you can actually just pull the power cord on the device. It's kind of funny because unplugging the power automatically bypasses this client bundle vulnerability, you can literally just go to your network cabinet right now, pull the power, disable the UPS, and as long as it doesn't shut down gracefully, it'll bypass this persistence mechanism. It won't allow the backdoor to reload. People ask me all the time in chat, why have there been so many vulnerabilities lately? Why does it feel like every week there's a new bug, a new big story to talk about? And I don't think that this month is actually different than any other months. I think what's happening is that people like myself, like other people on YouTube, are just making more videos and talking about these vulnerabilities, but there are new CVEs, there are new vulnerabilities found basically like every week, every day, where some threat actor is caught doing something or some bug is caught in some software. This is kind of just like the nature of cybersecurity, and I think it's really interesting that there are so many people who just don't know that this is reality. They're, they're like, th this is happening all the time, everywhere. It's just, we're talking about it more. So I feel like it feels like more is happening, but I think this is just what's happening all the time. So anyway, if you think that's interesting, you want to see more videos, hit that sub button, really appreciate it. And then go check this video out. YouTube thinks you'll like it. Appreciate it. Goodbye.